Shalom, everyone. Welcome to this week's journey through Torah. This week, we are in Parsha Bo, which is uh, translated as come or go, depending on the context. And this is when Yahweh tells uh, Moshe to go into Pharaoh to once again say, let my people go. And uh, we, we, we see through this interchange, if you're reading through, you've gone through some of the plagues by now, and now you're getting ready to see the culmination of all these coming together and the end of all these plagues, you're about to see uh, Israel being set go and, and everything that's leading up to that. We're getting there. And there's some things that need to be established before they come out. Example, so who exactly is going? I mean, it seems like a question of, uh, well, I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? Well, Pharaoh didn't think so. Pharaoh asked Moshe, so who's going? And so there are some important things to answer here, uh, not just physically, but spiritually and, and what they mean for uh, Israel back then and what they mean for us as well today. We're also going to look at a couple elements regarding uh, Pesach, Passover, and uh, ultimately at the end of this, we'll get to a couple things regarding how that testifies of Yeshua, which I'm hoping that you see a lot of these as we go through the study as well. Okay, so the name of this parsha is Bo, and it's a uh, Shemot 10, 1 to 13, 16. And before we get in there, I, I want us to understand that we have to seek identity in Yahweh. Um, the, the world today, it's, it's big on identity, and, and who am I really? And, and we're, we're always looking for somewhere else to find who, who I am and who I'm supposed to be. But Yahweh says that our identity is in Him. Our identity is in a people that he set apart and he established and he called out and he redeemed. So we, we must identify as his people. And if we do that, that's going to change how we see things. It's going to change how we do things. It's going to change how we live our life daily. And it's going to change the things that we see as important and not important. Okay. Um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs puts it this way. identity provides a link and a purpose. Identity is always particular and is based on story. And the narrative that links me to the past guides me in the present and places me on responsibility for the future. This is identity. Our common story coming in together tells us where we were, where we are, and where we're supposed to be going. And this is what Yahweh was doing for Israel, and especially in their redemption. Remember, he said, when I bring you out of Mitzrayim, this is, I, I will redeem you. So what he told Moshe, right? And he gave four different aspects of redemption in chapter six. And so here he says, I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to bring you out. And guess what, guys? I don't want you to just to think of this as a one and done kind of scenario. Um, you must remember what I did for you. And you must remember to tell it to your children so that they won't go back there. So that they will remember what it was like there and what I brought you out of. Okay. And so much of the Torah relates just on that, and you shall teach it to your children, teaching the next generation, showing them the differences between clean and clean and holy and common, showing them the heart of Yahweh, showing them the word that he has for all of us to, to live and to walk in. It's very important, and that's why it says, uh, children, obey your parents in the Lord, because the parents are supposed to be teaching the children the righteous ways of Yahweh, so that we don't go pursuing our own ideas, our own things, our own ways that lead us into paths of destruction, but that we do the things that will bring us together in a, in a common unity, a common goal, in a place of serving Yahweh. Uh, Jonathan Sachs continues, he says, if we want our children and our society to be moral, we need a collective story that tells us where we came from and what our task is in the world. The story of the Exodus, especially is told on Pesach at the, at the Seder table, is always the same, yet ever-changing. An almost infinite set of variations on a single set of themes that we internalize in ways that are unique to us. Yet, we all share as members of the same historically extended community. When they all came out, each family had their own story to tell their children. But that didn't remove them from being part of a nation that was called out and brought out. See, they, had, they, they maintained their individual identity and the identity within each of the tribes, but yet they were 
to come to learn to identify as a collective group, one people called Israel. And so that comes down to um, this exchange between Moshe and Pharaoh. How did Moshe view the people of Israel? How did Pharaoh view the people of Israel as far as who was important to go into worship and uh, who was Yahweh's people and, and who were the ones that were supposed to be called out, right? So we look at this in chapter 10 uh, of Shemot, of Exodus, in chapter 10, and we're going to go to verses uh, 8 through 11. It says, So Moshe and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go serve Yahweh your God. But which ones are to go? <laughs> Interesting question, right? So Moshe says, We will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, for we must hold a feast to Yahweh. Moshe is emphasizing we will go as one people, or we're not going yet. We're not going to leave till our redemption out of here is complete. We're not going to leave anyone behind. When we leave, we're going out as one body. We're going out as one people, one community of people set apart to Yahweh, not as a bunch of groups of families and, and, and isolated from each other. It says we're not leaving anyone behind. When we go, we're going out together. And uh, this, this shows us the need for uh, corporate identity as well as individual identity. Yes, he is my personal Elohim. He is my God. But he is also the God of Israel and collectively all the people in it. Okay, we cannot change either of these. They both have their unique views, but one does not discount the other. They coexist and they need to be understood that way. Okay, matter of fact, in Acts 15, the uh, Yeshua's Talmudim were, t were saying what to do with the new people that are coming in to have faith of Yahweh. They're, these are people from the nations. They don't know anything about serving the one true God. They don't know anything about the covenants, don't know anything about all these things, but they know he is the one true God. They know that he is the one they, that they want to serve. They want to serve the God of Israel. How do we do that? And so... Uh, in Acts 15, the disciples said, okay, let's just start them with a few of these things. Go back and read it. And, uh, and, and, and he lists like four things to basically keep eyes, ideas of uh, re relating to kosher and uh, relating to idolatry, you know, dealing with these things. Then the next thing he says, it's often overlooked. He says, go to the synagogue on Shabbat so that you can hear the Torah taught. He says to do these four things, this is your starting point, then go to the synagogue on Shabbat because Moshe, what Moshe had written, is going to be taught there. And so we, we have this idea of we need to gather in together as a people of Yahweh to hear the Torah taught to us. Okay? Uh, we see throughout the, the Brit Hadashah, where was Yeshua on Shabbat? It says on Shabbat, he went to the synagogue as his custom was. Uh, his Talmudim were with him. And so we also see Yeshua in the fields teaching people. We also see they would gather in their homes. We also see they would gather at the temple. Okay? None of these things did away with the other. They all had their place and their purpose. Okay? We even see in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, it says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We can't encourage one another if we're never around each other. So we have to learn to do that. And uh, I know a lot of people today don't have congregations or, or assemblies or groupings of people near them where they can gather. I pray that changes for you, because it is the heart of the Father that we're not uh, just an island to ourselves and left all alone. We, we need be part of a group, a body of people, not just uh, us, ourselves and just our own personal family. We have to look outside of that. Yeshua said, occupy till I come. He didn't say hide away and just barely survive until I come. So we have to fulfill that goal. But back to our story, okay, continuing in uh, Exodus chapter 10. Okay, so he says, we must go in verse 9, we must go and hold a feast to Yahweh. He says, we're going to go, not just with our sons and our daughters, but we're going to go with our flocks and our herds too, because we have to go, we have to hold a feast to Yahweh. It's ki hag Yahweh lanu. We have to go hold a feast to Yahweh. Hag is a word that's used there, and uh, hag is the word for the festival, for a festival that that's, says we must hold to Yahweh. Hag is also the root of circle, or something that is a circular, cyclical, 
And so it, it's something that's going to be reoccurring, something that's going to happen more than once. Okay, and, and I think Pharaoh may have been picking up on this, but Moshe was saying, when we go, we're even taking our flocks and our herds with us because we are going to worship Yahweh. We're going into the wilderness to the mountain and we will worship Yahweh there. We will do that with all we are and all that we have. You know, so we're going out with our sons and our daughters, all of our families, and we're taking you know, herds and cattle, we're taking this with us too. All right. So what happens? Verse 10. But he said to them, Yahweh be with you if I ever let you and your little ones go. Look, you have come to some evil purpose in mind. No, go, the men among you, and serve Yahweh, for that's what you're asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Pharaoh says, okay, fine, you can go, but no, 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 you're going to go serve your God my way. You know, I'm still going to maintain some rule here. I'm still going to maintain, uh, you're, you're not really going to be free because, you know, we'll let the men go, but I'm going to keep the wives and the children, the livestock and all these things. But just, uh, just let, let the guys, no, he's saying, we don't worship Yahweh Pharaoh's way. Okay, we don't let Pharaoh dictate how we worship Yahweh. Yahweh was calling them completely out of where they were. And uh, so this is what Moshe was saying. We're not going partially. We're going with all of us. And uh, Hirsch says in the Pentateuch, we must all go. Each and all are integral parts of our community. None and nothing may remain. for We are all to form a circle about God. He says, Hag Hashem. We are to form a circle about God. In other words, we're surrounding him as, as he dwells in us. So God calls us together around him. And when he calls us, we serve him wholeheartedly with all we are and all we have. Nothing is exempt, right? We appear before him wholeheartedly with everything. And so there's a few things to look at here. One, worship of Yahweh and following his instructions for our redemption and deliverance, it starts in our homes. Okay? This is not. Uh, the, the, the fullness of all this is in the homes. No, this is the start of it is in the homes. We must have our personal relationship with Yahweh in our homes. Okay. Because that's where it, we prove that it is personal, that it is real, that it is individual. I'm not just serving Yahweh where to be seen. I'm not just serving Yahweh in the midst of an assembly or a community or at, or at my job or whatever. I'm serving him everywhere. And so we can gather corporately to worship if we are individually worshiping at home. See, if we're worshiping within our hearts throughout the day in, in our homes and just as we're living life, we're, we have a heart towards Yahweh, a thankful heart, and worshiping Him, then when we come to a gathering, it's a natural outflowing of what's already in us and what we've already been doing. Okay? It's not like uh, we're not going to worship Yahweh the six days of the week, and then on the seventh day, it's like, now we're going to worship Yahweh. No, no. We, we, we come together on Shabbat, to allow what has been building in us to come out. And that is a, a heart of gratitude, a heart to Yahweh. Our gatherings are an extension of our lives the, the rest of the time. Okay, Now, as well as this, worship at home does not replace a gathering. And worship at a gathering does not replace the home. <laughs> See, they worshiped in homes, they worshiped in synagogues, and they worshiped in the temple. And yes, they even met uh, out in the fields or whatever. I mean, it, it, the idea is worship anywhere. But this did not take the place of a gathering together to be a people. The problem here, especially in America, is that um, we want to isolate ourselves from other people, you know, because everything is not exactly like me. And guys, that's the point. We're to learn to be like Yahweh. And that means we change. And this is a constant and continual thing. So we need to put ourselves in his hands so that we are changing and, and pursuing his heart and all of these things. Okay. And what are we supposed to do as we learn? Teach it to our children. That's part of the Shema, right? And the important thing about this is, uh, I want to make the point, it's not a, a congregational leader's sole responsibility to teach your children. Now, they will teach your children, okay? But the idea is not to be like, okay, they're going to teach your children uh, what, what the Word of Yahweh says, and then the rest of the week, they're not going to be hearing anything about it at all. doesn't work that way. What is happening 
is there to hear the Torah taught as a, at an assembly and at a gathering together. And this is lived and reiterated throughout the week by the parents. As the parents are learning, they are teaching it to their children. And then ultimately, we're all learning and growing together. We see in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7, says that. These words I am commanding you today are to be on your heart. That means it's, it's in you. It's a continual thing. And you are to teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. So the idea here is we worship Yahweh with ourselves in our assemblies, but you got to worship him with your family. You know, the, the family has to worship. And we see a couple things here. In Acts 10, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now in Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, what was called the Italian cohort. He was a devout man, revering God with all his household. And he gave Zedekiah generously to the people and prayed to God continually. And um, the angel appeared to him and basically told him to go get Kepha, go get Peter, and, and come have him teach you. Right? And that's what happened. In Acts eleven fourteen. Uh, he was told, he will speak to, with to you words by which you will be saved, you and all your household. See, and Peter was to come and to give the word of Yahweh to Cornelius. He was a devout man, but he couldn't go to the synagogue and he couldn't go to the temple. So how does, how does he learn? He needed to have someone in his life to have this relationship. And it says that him and his family were saved. In Acts 16, 31 to 34, it says, uh, put your trust in the Lord Yeshua and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in his household. And he took them that very hour and washed their wounds. And at once was immersed in all his household. And the jailer brought them to his house and he set food before them. And he was overjoyed that he with his entire household had put their trust in God. The, the, the jailer's entire household was saved because he repented. And that, that, and that led over into his family, and he was leading his family spiritually in that. In Acts 18.8, it says, Crispus, the synagogue leader, put his faith in the Lord along with his whole household. And many of the Corinthians, upon hearing, were, be, were believing and being immersed. So back to our story regarding uh, Pesach. So in Exodus 12, we're going to look in verses 3 to 7. It says, tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of the month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one lamb for the household. See that? One lamb for the household. But if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor are to take one according to the number of the people. According to each person eating, you are to make your count for the lamb. Your lamb is to be without blemish, a year old male, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You must watch over it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly, the congregation of Israel, is to slaughter it at twilight. And they are to take the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the crossbeam of the houses where they will eat it. So one of the things to look here first off is uh, in verse 7, it says they are to take the blood and put it on the two doorposts and over the top lintel, right? Well, the two doorposts, literally it says hamzuzot. That's what we would call the mezuzah. Now, you may think of the mezuzah as the little box that's put on the door frame of, of the doors. Literally, mezuzah is the door frame of the door, not, not just the box that goes on it. It is the door frame. And what's supposed to be there? Okay, so a picture of the blood that's there. But we also see in Deuteronomy 6, 9, it says these words that he gives us, that we are to write them on our doors and on our gates. So we have a picture of the blood and the word working together. And the idea is when we go in, in into our home and out of our home, we see the word and the blood. And we are reminded we don't live for ourselves. We live for him. Okay. And then... Uh, on the mezuzahs, you normally find uh, the letter Shein for Shaddai, El Shaddai. Why? Because he is the Shemar Delet Israel. He is the watcher of the doors of Israel. He is the one who watches over our homes, watches over our doors and all the people who dwell therein. So we have pictures of the word and the blood working together from El Shaddai, which we see uh, further in Revelation 12:11. It says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. In Revelation 19:13 says he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The blood and the Word work together in leading us in our redemption and even in our daily going in and out and back and forth, okay? Now, let's back up for a minute before we go forward in here. Let's back up for a second in verses 3 and 4 that we read in Exodus 12, where it says to take the lamb, one per household. So, all Israel was to eat this, we'll see this later, but it was to be eaten in one house. Now, you can't eat 
each household in one house. So what happens is one house took a limb, and then if, the, if there wasn't enough members in this household to eat at all, then they were to invite their neighbors to come and to all partake together until they had enough people that they could eat the whole lamb. That's what it says to take them according to the number of the people you are to take them. But what we find here as well is that uh, they couldn't just go just invite anyone next to them. You know, what if they were Egyptians and, and didn't want anything to do with this? You know, well, they wouldn't invite them, obviously. So this was an act of redemption, he said, bringing them out. So this was a, a covenant meal, so to speak. And so this was a, a uh, or falling under a, a peace offering as well. So this was all of these things saying, this is a holy thing. And so as they come to Yahweh, this is a people doing so in an, in an act of faith to do it. And he says to take them according to the number. Now, we, we, in this, we see something that kind of hints at prophecy here as well. Because the word that's used for it says to take it according to the number is bamiksat. Bamiksat, the root is kasas, which means to allocate or designate something. Okay, and um, the word that's used there for the, for the lamb, it's generic. It doesn't mean specifically a sheep or a lamb. It just means a generic, it could have been lamb or a goat or whatever. But it says to take a lamb, and the instruction that's here is to take the lamb that was designated for this purpose. And then you apply the blood of the home. This provides protection for those that are inside the home. And Yahweh says, then when I see the blood, I will pass over these homes. Now, some people think that this is where we get the, the name for Passover. Um, not exactly. Okay, the, the, What we call Passover is Pesach. Pesach is what's literally referred to as the lamb itself. It says it is Yahweh's Pesach. Pesach is, he says, I will pass over, I will jump over and, and go over these homes. Okay, But when we say we're observing Pesach, Pesach is literally specifically referring to the lamb itself. And it is the lamb and our obedience to apply the blood as that which is delivering and protecting and watching over and providing the mercy from Yahweh to the people of Israel. We see more pictures of this as well. The lamb that was designated for this purpose of protecting the people by the blood. More pictures of Yeshua. John 1 29 says the next day John sees Yeshua coming and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Revelation 13 8 says that it was the Lamb that was uh, slain from the foundation of the world. He was designated for this purpose. And that's what Yeshua says. He was designated for this purpose to provide redemption for you as his people. Okay? In Exodus 12 13, it says the blood is a sign. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, so there will be no plague among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So he says that he sees the blood. When he sees, now here's the thing, did he need to see the blood to know who were his people? It's like he's has to look at a map to find out who lives where. No. No, what was he looking for? He was looking for those with the heart of obedience, those who had the heart to Shema, those who had the heart to hear him, hear his voice, and do what he is asking. So it, the, they applied the blood as an act of submission and an act of obedience to Yahweh. And he says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So he, seeing the blood was, an, it was a, an integral thing there, right? Which makes us think of Yahweh Yireh, the one who sees to it, the one who provides, right? When we say he is the God who sees, kind of makes me think back to Abraham, right? Abraham at the Akedah, when he, the binding of Yitzhak, now, if we go back and we look at this, we find Avraham and Yitzhak, they're walking to the mountain, and they're getting ready to do this, and, and Yitzhak looks up at his dad and says, Dad, yeah, son, well, we got the wood, we got the fire, are we forgetting anything, Dad? Where's, where's the lamb? And yeah, Avraham answers something very interesting. He says that God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And they walked on together. More interesting, if you look in the Hebrew, I mean, it's not just a statement of faith where he says God will provide. And, and I'm just thinking, okay, well, it's you, son, you know? Uh, no, he's, he's thinking God will provide. God will provide. On a, all the way up there, walking in faith, and this is, he's committed to what he was going to do, but all the time saying God will provide. 
That's why he, he called on Yahweh Yireh, right? He is the God who provides. He is the God who sees to it. But he says literally, Elohim Yireh lo hase. He says God will provide himself a lamb. Literally, this, how, this is how it reads. Elohim will provide himself the lamb. Not just a lamb, the lamb. So uh, this, is, this is a prophecy in effect. And then the the ram that was caught caught in the in the in the thorns, and then all more pictures and shadows of revealing Yeshua in our midst, okay, and and what he came to do. So back to uh, Exodus twelve, back to the story here that we're looking in the, in the Exodus twelve twenty three says Adonai will pass through to strike down the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the crossbeam and the two doorposts, Adonai will pasach that door. And he will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you down. This isn't the only time we see something like this. I mean, we know that Pesach was to be done year after year. Once, uh, once you go into the land, you were to observe this year after year after year so that your children never forget, right? Um, but we also see in Isaiah 31, 5, it says, Like hovering birds, so Adonai Savaot will protect Yerushalayim. By protecting, he will deliver. And by Pesach, by passing over, he will save. So we again have a picture of Yahweh passing over the people of Israel in a means of protection and deliverance and saving his people. Speaking of his people, who can partake of the Passover lamb? Who are the ones that could, uh, that could partake of this and, and be involved in this redemption of the people of Yahweh? Well, the short answer would be those who had the faith to do so. Okay. But scripture says no stranger and no foreigner is to partake of Pesach. So that means you had to be part of the family to partake. That means you were part of the faith. That means you were part of those who were being obedient to the God of Israel. If you were not, you could not partake of Passover. This was a covenant meal. All right. Exodus 12, 42 to 49 says this. It is a night to be much observed unto Yahweh for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of, of Yahweh to be observed of all the children of Israel and their generations. And Yahweh said to Moshe and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat it thereof. No stranger is permitted to eat the Passover. But if anyone has a slave he bought for money, when you have circumcised him, he may eat it. Neither a traveler or a hired servant may eat it. See this? So, in other words, if he's part of your family or if he's been circumcised, circumcised was a show of covenant, okay? Uh, like Avraham, it wasn't, uh, circumcision was not the covenant. It was a sign of covenant that they had professed faith in the one true God. He is the one they believe in. He is the one they follow. And so this was a sign of covenant. So that's what we're looking at here. Someone who's just traveling through town and wants to partake of Passover with you because it looks like a nice meal. Nope. Not going to do it. Someone who is, oh, just interested. Oh, I just want to learn a little about you guys. Nope, can't do it. These are for the people who have made commitments to Yahweh. Not just someone traveling through, not just uh, someone you've hired, right? Not just someone that you've hired for a task or for a job or whatever, or someone you may, just may have associations with, whatever. No, this is for people who are in the family. The people who are part of covenant. And that's what it's given here when it says no uncircumcised are to, are to eat of it. And Philippians 3.3, 3, it says, For it is we who are circumcised, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who make our boast in the Messiah Yeshua. We do not put our confidence in human qualifications. In other words, we're circumcised in the Spirit in, in our hearts. It is Yahweh, it is Yeshua who does that for us. It doesn't have to be the natural sign it is given within us. That's why Rav Shaul says, if, if you were circumcised, then great. And if you weren't, you don't have to be, although it is interesting to look at uh, that uh, there were those that worked with Rav Shaul who were not naturally born Israel, whom he had circumcised. That's all other issues, not getting into that. But the point of it being is, uh, do we serve Yahweh or not? And if we serve him, then we can have a place, okay? We can come in, we can do that. But if we don't serve him, then it, it, we do not have that place there. Deuteronomy 10.16 says, circumcise the foreskin of your heart, 
and don't be stiff-necked anymore. Did you, did you ever understand that the circumcision of the heart was a Torah principle? It was in the Torah. It's not just something that we say or have heard you know, from a uh, New Testament or even modern times. This was a Torah principle to circumcise your heart. And what does that mean? Have the sign of covenant written on your heart. Have the words of Yahweh written on your heart. Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 and Jeremiah 4 4 talk the same thing. God will circumcise your heart and then tells you to circumcise the, uh, your hearts. And so this is what we're looking at. To set ourselves to Yahweh and dedicating ourselves to Him. Matter of fact, we look at this as well in Romans 2, 26 and 27. It says, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the Torah, won't his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Indeed, the man who is physically uncircumcised but obeys the Torah will stand on judgment of you who have had a Brit Milah and have the Torah written out but violate it. So it says someone who has not been circumcised but follows Yahweh, keeps his Torah, he says, this is the, the one who is righteous, not the one who may have ha uh, had the sign of the covenant, but it's not in his heart. See, the heart is the important thing. The rest is a, is a showing outwardly of what's there, which we see as well in Romans 4, 11 and 12. Speaking of Avraham, says, Avraham received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of the trust he had while he was uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who are trusting while uncircumcised, that the righteousness might be credited to them as well. Also, he is the father of the circumcised, to those not only circumcised, but also walking in the footsteps of the trust of our father Abraham before the circumcision. See? So Abraham is claimed by those who are and are not circumcised. The issue in both cases is the heart to follow Yahweh. And we see this as well in, uh, in the story regarding Hezekiah, when Hezekiah was calling uh, the, the people of Israel back to repentance and coming back to worship Yahweh. We see this in 2 Chronicles 30, in verses 1 through 5, it says, Hezekiah sent word to all Israel and Judah, and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh to come to the house of Adonai at Jerusalem to keep the Passover for Adonai, the God of Israel. The king and his officials and the entire congregation in Jerusalem had decided to celebrate Passover in the second month. Why the second month? Because there was a provision if you could not keep it in the first month that you could do it everything the exact same way in the same dates in the second month, the second Pesach. Verse 3 says, For they were not able to celebrate it at the regular time since not enough Kohanim had consecrated themselves, nor had the people assembled in Jerusalem. The matter seemed right in the eyes of the king and of the entire community. So they decided to issue a decree and to proclaim it throughout all Israel from Beersheba to Dan, calling all the people to come to Yerushalayim to celebrate the Passover for Adonai, the God of Israel, for it had not been celebrated as prescribed for a long time. And if you go down to verses 10 and 11, you'll see that the couriers, they carried these letters all, you know, to all the tribes and all these places, but they were mocked and scorned, and uh, many people just, they were just made fun of for calling the people back to Jerusalem. The people were steeped in their idolatry, and they didn't want to see serving Yahweh and the spiritual things this way as important. They wanted to serve their God their way. And so they mocked people in being called to repentance. But we do read, some came. Okay? <laughs> and you know, you're always going to have that. You're always going to have people mocking and scorning the people who are trying to do what Yahweh is asking us to do. But those who have the heart to come and return, do it. That's what he's calling us to. So going on to uh, 2 Chronicles 30, verses 18 to 20, it says, Although a great multitude of the people, many of them from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulun, have not purified themselves. This means they had not purified themselves from exile, and many of them probably weren't circumcised. They still ate the Passover lamb, contrary to what is written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May Adonai, who is good, Atone for everyone who prepares his heart to seek Adonai, the God of his fathers, even, even though he is not pure according to the rules of the sanctuary. And Adonai heard Hezekiah and healed the people. See that? So it, it really come, does come down to an issue of the heart and how we serve him. Uh, people say, well, God knows my heart. The problem is we often use that as a mode to get out of doing something we know we should. And uh, that's right, Yahweh does know our heart. And if that's the case, he knows that. But if we are trying to serve him 
the best we can. And uh, he is gracious and compassionate and will continue to draw us to him in the midst of all that. Okay, so back to Exodus 12, back to our story, uh, verse 46. It is to be eaten in one house. You are not to take any of the meat outside the house and you are not to break any of its bones. The whole community of Israel is to keep it. Interesting because it says you're to eat it in one house, the whole community of Israel. You cannot fit the whole community of Israel in one house. So what does this mean? This means each of the individuals and the families, they were to gather in one house and they are to partake of it in that house. None of this was, was, a, was able to go outside of the house. All of those in the community of Israel are to partake. You are not to take any of it out of the house for any other reason to give to anyone else or even have some left over. No, none. This was a complete and total issue of faith eaten in one house, eaten in his house. All, all their houses as individuals collectively became one house at that point. Collectively became a people of Israel, the whole community of Israel. They were to partake at that time. And then interesting as well, no bones to be broken. Another picture of Yeshua knowing that uh, none of his bones were broken uh, when he went to his crucifixion. None of his bones were broken there as well. So moving on, verse 48. If a foreigner is staying with you and wants to observe Adonai's Pesach, all his males must be circumcised. In other words, they have to profess covenant. They have to be willing to say, Yahweh is the one true God and we will serve him. Then he may, pre- he may partake and observe of the Pesach. And then he will also be counted like a citizen of the land. But it says no uncircumcised person will eat of it. And then verse 49, it says the same teaching is to apply equally to the citizen and the foreigner living among you. Whether you are naturally born a part of Israel or not born part of Israel, but want to serve the God of Israel, he says, you are, you are all together part of his people. And he says the same teaching is to apply literally Torah achat yihye. Torah achat, one Torah is to apply equally to the citizen and the foreigner living among you, that living among you as a people of Israel. And we see this in other places in the Torah as well, like in number, Numbers 15, 14 to 16. If a foreigner stays with you or whoever may be with you through all your generations, and he wants to bring an offering made by fire as a fragrant aroma to Adonai, he is to do the same as you. For this community, there shall be the same law, hukah akat, one, one hukah, one way. For you as a foreigner living with you, this is a permanent regulation through all your generations. The foreigners to be treated the same way before Adonai as yourselves, because he, he is to come into a place of covenant and pursuing Yahweh the same way, okay? And then now we, we see more pictures here. Yeshua of our Passover, we've seen a couple of things here coming into this, but the scripture testifies of Yeshua being a Passover for us. What does that mean? Our redemption, one who provided a deliverance for us, one who provided a way for us to come out of bondage and the oppression and come into the presence of Yahweh. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 to 8 says, Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For the Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Okay, and uh, so we testify that Yeshua being a Passover lamb for us, right? Well, how some, uh, another thing that testifies of this? Uh, in Exodus 12, 5, it says that the lamb was to be selected and inspected to say that there were no blemishes on it. The lamb was to be without blemish. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says that, that Yeshua was inspected and was blameless. It says, verse 18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but as the precious blood of the Messiah, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And uh, to testify that he was without blemish and without spot, and he can provide that for us, he was inspected multiple times by multiple people. He was inspected by Pilate in Matthew 27, 11, inspected by Herod in Luke 23, 8 to 12, inspected by Annas in John 18, 12 and 13, inspected by Caiaphas in Matthew 26, 57. None of them could find fault in him, that he, and so therefore he was the lamb without blemish or defect. All of this testifying of what he did for us. He provided a way to bring us to the Father. And so when we come to him, we partake of the life that he gave us 
and we follow him. And that's what Yeshua came. He said, follow me. And that's what we're doing. We follow him. Uh, that means we might have to leave some things behind. But we will have whatever we need for this journey. And so we follow him. We walk with him. We live with him. But guess what, guys? As we're walking through life, doing things that Yeshua told us to do, as we're following him, if you look to your left and to your right, you're going to see others doing the same thing. Don't forget that as much as you desire to follow Yahweh, don't forsake and forget the others who are trying to do the same thing. Okay, let's learn to walk together and let's learn to uh, show the heart of the Father to one another. And it says that the world will testify of his goodness in our midst when we do this. They will know him because of your life that's been set apart. All right. Well, guys, that's all I've got for you today. So I pray this has been a blessing to you. I pray this has been challenging for you as well. If this has been a blessing, then share it in whatever avenue that you watch or listen. Uh, share these things to help them get out there. We do believe these are words to help bring life to people. So if you believe that, help share to get these out there as well. And if this has been a blessing to you, we pray that uh, you consider making a donation to help us continue to keep these videos out there, to keep us recording keep us moving on and getting all these uh, set up and together so we can continue distribution on these. Okay. We don't charge anything for these videos. We're just putting them out there. And if we want to have us continue to do so, then please help us in that journey too. Okay. So if this has been a, a blessing. I pray you are blessed, be a blessing. And until next time, chill.